Okay, now I'm going to start. So, uh, hello again for everyone. My name is Stephanie Glukova, and today we'll talk about my work that's called Sketching of Generalized Basal Beans Simulated with a Discrete Dipole Approximation. First of all, I'd like to tell you a few words about basal beams, about their special features, applications. Then I'll move to the goal of this work, and I will talk also about the method we used. It's a discrete dipole approximation. And finally, I will mostly talk about the theoretical part of this work related to the basal beam generalization and the discussion of the basal beam basis. So uh, I will also conclude with implementation in the code and the results. So basal beams are probably one of the most famous examples of structured lights that have lots of uh, special features such as uh, diffraction pre-propagation and self-healing ability. Also, such beams are vortex beams, so they possess orbital angular momentum, and they have lots of applications in such fields as optical manipulation or tweezing, uh, material processing, imaging, and many others. So one basal beam can be different from another one, first of all, by its order. So in the simplest case or paraxial case, uh, you can see that basal beams have, uh, basal beam of zero order have its maximum in the center, maximum intensity, and uh, non-zero order basal beams have intensity in the first ring. But there are also uh, various uh, vector basal beam types. They are not from literature. And uh, here you can see uh, total magnitude profiles for various basal beam types. So probably the most uh, popular beams are TE and TM. They are also closely related to the cylindrical vector wave functions. So all of these vector basal beams have lots of applications in various, in various fields. So, and sometimes it's uh, quite important to understand the process of scheduling of such fields. So here is the purpose of my work. And the purpose was to implement the most general model of the basal beam scheduling. Uh, that means that we want to consider an arbitrary particle. Uh, it's uh, especially important for basal beams because uh, all the previous works related to the basal beams uh, scattering were uh, mostly uh, considered the particles with simple uh, symmetries such as spheres, cylinders, and uh, other simple shapes. So here we use the discrete dipole approximation method that allows us to calculate basal beam scattering by the particles of Orbitary shape and internal structure. Uh, second, we want to implement the most common, commonly used basal beam types of arbitrary order. But to choose the beams to implement, we have to have uh, some kind of classification of these beams. But there was no uh, complete classification, so we proposed a new one. And uh, finally, we also wanted to allow users to generate more complicated basal beam types. For example, a linear combinations of some uh, basal beams. So that requires uh, the understanding of the basis of basal beams. So here we go. As I already said, uh, we will use the discrete dipole approximation. And uh, this method is really nice for calculating scattering for arbitrary particles. And in this method, we take a scattering particles, a scatter, scatter particle, and divide it in a set of cubical subvolumes. These subvolumes can be replaced by the point dipoles, and then we can find the results in scattering field um, as um, uh, considering the interactions between dipoles with each other and in the incident line. It's important to note that this method is actually a numerical exit, that we can increase the accuracy of our results, increasing the number of dipoles. So here we used uh, an ADA. It's probably one of the most uh, popular open source parallel implementation of the DDA method. And ADA allows calculating uh, various scattering quantities, such as scattering intensities, uh, cross sections, uh, optical forces, and many others. So we here we, uh, we want to implement Bessel beams as a new incident field. So let's talk a little bit about the Bessel beam theory. So uh, first of all, basal beams are solutions of Helmgold's equation in cylindrical coordinates. Here is the equation. But sometimes it's more convenient to consider Hertz vector potentials, or in other words, it's a Davis approach. So here we can express electromagnetic field of uh, vector basal beams uh, via its Hertz vector potentials. Uh, that's related by the, this differential operator in the matrix form. The point is that Hertz vector potentials are quite easier uh, quite simple solution. So for Helmgold's equation, you can see it, it's just proportional to the basal function. 
And uh, in general case, the electromagnetic field of the solims is quite complex and uh, it uh, doesn't have uh, zero components. Okay, and in this step, we propose our, our new theoretical approach for the tunerization of vessel beams. And uh, we decided to consider um, general vessel beam as a linear combination of all possible solutions of uh, Hertz vector potentials. Uh, so here we found out that actually longitude of components of Hertz vector potentials can be expressed via its transverse components of uh, different orders. So here we can uh, describe a general basal beam uh, using this two by two matrix, uh, just with four components or complex, complex parameters. Here is the definition of our matrix M. And uh, the point is this matrix is really simple, especially for the most of the known basal beam types. And for example, you can see here the matrices M for X and Y polarizations of LE type. Here they are, and it's really easy to check that these two matrices are related by the polarization rotation matrix. And uh, uh, that's exactly how these two fields are related, just by rotation. All right. Um, so uh, here you can see these matrices M for different vessel beam types. And uh, also you can here, uh, um, here see that um, our matrices are, are related to uh, different polarizations uh, by their polarization rotation and the different matrices of different vessel beam types also related by their duality rotation by these matrices. So uh, you can also find here special features about uh, CS vessel beam type. It's a circle symmetric because it's actually symmetrical under polarization and duality rotation. So uh, we uh, also found out using our method that we can actually introduce a new basal beam type. It's an alternative CS type. It is also symmetrical and uh, these four matrices together can, can be similar to the power matrices. Okay, so there's, there's not all, all the known basal beam types, of course, and uh, one can ask a question, what is the basis of all these basal beam types? So, to answer these questions, it's uh, usually uh, helpful to consider orthogonality of different basal beam types. But there is a problem because we cannot do this like for plane waves. We have to use some kind of uh, functional inner product. So in our work, we introduce uh, a new inner product for basal beams. Uh, consider the fact that actually uh, the field of for basal beam types is uh, non-square square integrable, so we use a special uh, multiplier for this. So now we can define orthogonal basis for a vessel beam. And uh, as you can see here, the first one actually was already discussed in the article by Wang in 1970s. Okay, and there are also some non-orthogonal bases. So as it's not uh, ridiculous, we decided to choose exactly non-orthogonal basis because it's actually the simplest basis. It really corresponds to the components of our presented matrix M. And it's probably the most convenient for the implementation of different basal wave times in our code. So here is a slide about our implementation in the code. So all of the non basal beam types have been implemented in a separate fork of uh, other, other GitHub. So you can go to the link, QR code, and uh, it's really available for anyone. It's uh, tested. So uh, we implemented our basal beams uh, in a two ways. So the first one is direct one. So here you specify the beam type. For example, it's LE type. Then you specify the beam order, half cone angle, and, and, and like this. So, uh, the second way is a general one. So here you specify a matrix M for arbitrary or general basal beam type. You can also specify here order, angle, and then for real components of matrix M. And then there are uh, optional imaginary parts because uh, in, most, in most cases, the matrices for basal beams is real. So there's no need to specify all these uh, imaginary parts. Okay, so we have tested our code with reference to the generalized Lorentz theory. Uh, so here you can see the comparison of scattering intensities in two planes 
um, for the case of uh, the basal beam scattering by a coated sphere. As you can see, the results match very well, so it's validates our code. And now it's really easy for anyone to use the code for, comput for computing more uh, complex cases of basal beam scattering. So here is the conclusion of my speech. Uh, we proposed a new theoretical approach that allowed us to generalize various basal beam types. And uh, now it's really easy to describe anyone use a uh, common basis. So we have implemented this, this for, uh, these types of basal beams in other code and tested our code with reference to the results for spheres. So in the future, we are going to implement our theoretical results for the uh, research related to the basal beam schedule near substrate and calculation of optical forces. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me. Thank you very much for interesting talk. Uh, I see that uh, Sasha has a question. So please go ahead. Yes, thank you, Stefania, for an interesting talk. I just have a, a very brief question. So could you please clarify on what are the concrete benefits from using uh, DDA in comparison, for example, with console multiphysics or CST microwave studio? All right, so uh, in general, DDA is a really interesting tool because you, you can really control everything uh, in comparison to COMSOL because uh, I, I don't know, it's just really adjustable, for example. Plus, uh, there are still lots of data that uh, validate that ADA has a really nice results for computing uh, times and so on. And plus, it's really good accuracy. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Some more questions or comments? If not, I have just one. Can you compare, for example, the speed if you use couple dipoles and generalized Lorentz mean theory for the spheres you presented and computer memory demands or, or hardware demands? All right. Uh, so, okay, we haven't compared actually the speed for computation of, uh, of the scattering by the spheres because actually it's kind of obvious because uh, generalized Lorentz mean theory is uh, faster for computing for the spherical particles, but uh, the main advantages of our code that we can compute uh, scattering by really arbitrary particles. So there is just, there is an advantage of general source material, but only in a very restricted area of uh, applications. Yeah, so our, our experience is that typically if you, if you treat problems in more particles that are separated, so the couple dipoles probably are too greedy for the hardware needs. But maybe that's for another discussion. Anyway, thank you very much for your talk. Thank you.